Good evening, I'm Kay Stammers. A violent demonstration at Parliament House today as steel workers and miners protest against the loss of jobs. Qantas to press ahead with the dismissal of a thousand workers despite a $63 million profit and shortly our special report, The Man Who Shot the Pope. Angry miners and steel workers smashed their way in through the front doors of Parliament House in Canberra today in a violent demonstration over job losses. About 2,000 workers and their families travelled by train from Wollongong and Newcastle to demonstrate against retrenchments in the mining and steel industries. Ken Begg reports that the protest started peacefully enough. We want jobs! But once outside the front door, things started to go wrong. There were no serious injuries, despite some angry scuffles, and there were few arrests. For reasons still not clear, some of the union leaders didn't get to see the Prime Minister and a potentially dangerous situation was finally diffused when opposition leader Bill Hayden intervened with Mr Fraser's personal staff. Bill Hayden later agreed to talk to the workers and he used the occasion to unveil Labor's new plan to revive the economy. It includes increased tariff protection for BHP in exchange for job security. And the opposition leader had a word or two for the Prime Minister. Our main task is to get rid of Fraser. So anything we do today here in any way in which we conduct ourselves, we've got to make sure it doesn't play into the hands of that bastard because you know how you're misrepresented. Most of the workers were on their way home when the talks finished. The unions got a sympathetic hearing and promises of action. But what Canberra saw today were the angry faces of a recession, a recession that's starting to bite and bite deeply. The demonstration appears to have won some concessions from the government. After two hours of talks, the Industry and Commerce Minister, Mr Peacock, said the government would try to hold off further sackings by BHP pending a hearing by the Coal Industry Tribunal. Qantas is to proceed with a retrenchment of 1,000 staff, despite its posting today of a $63 million profit. Laurie Brennan reports that Qantas lost $24 million on its airline operations but the overall result was aided by the sale of the Wentworth Hotel. Like other big Australians, the flying kangaroo's in trouble, shedding, for example, 1,000 of its 12,000 staff over the past two years and about to retrench 1,000 more. But with $75.5 million from the sale of the Wentworth Hotel in Sydney and $25 million from the federal government, the 81-82 results on paper are healthy. The group's $63.4 million profit compared with the 80-81 loss of $17.3 million. But its airline operations lost $24 million, though this compared with a $41 million loss in 80-81. On the 23rd floor of the 50-storey $150 million new Qantas building, Chairman Jim Leslie said in a year when international well. airlines Thank lost $1.6 billion, Qantas had done a magnificent job. But the hard times persist.
I think this year probably is even tougher, I think. Mr. Leslie says the next two years will be rough for Qantas, the airline industry and the world economy. But he says he's more optimistic than most about the speed of recovery for all three. And with $23 million in the till, as he puts it, from the sale of the existing Qantas building, he's confident he can post a break-even or close to break-even result next year. His words, however, will be cold comfort to the 1,000 Qantas employees about to be offered a voluntary retrenchment package. For if that package is not accepted, those retrenchments will be forced. Logging of rainforests on the New South Wales north coast is to stop. After a six-hour cabinet meeting today, Premier Neville Rand said logging would be phased out as quickly as possible. He said cabinet was satisfied that no jobs would be lost as a result of this decision. There'll be a general election in Spain on Thursday, the third democratic election since the death of General Franco in 1975. But Franco's legacy of almost 40 years of fascist rule is still visible in the political life of the country. Although the socialists are expected to win the election, or win the election, the revived Falange, now called the New Force, can still make its sinister presence felt. Seven years after the death of General Franco, fascism is alive but not so well in Spain. These are the supporters of the late Spanish dictator campaigning for a return of the good, bad old days. The living heroes now are men like Colonel Tejero, who led the coup attempt in the Madrid parliament last year, now imprisoned for 30 years, along with General Melanz del Bosch, another conspirator against Spain's fledgling democracy. But democracy is a dirty word among Franco's old guard who view the prospect of a socialist victory in Thursday's poll with alarm and horror. But the reality is that the bully boys of the Falange, the only political party permitted by Franco, face a beating at the ballot box. Not one of the Falange's candidates is this time even likely to win a seat in Parliament. Such is the political change in Spain. But undeterred, the fascists fight on. This was one of the biggest rallies of any political party during Spain's election campaign so far. The wildest acclaim was for the leader of New Force, Senor Blas Pinar. The scenes reminiscent of the days when Franco used to address the crowds in this same Madrid square. The Nazi-style salutes, the fascist battle songs of the Spanish Civil War, and the impassioned rhetoric. It was something rather chilling, sinister, that all this could really still be happening in a country soon to join the European community and already a member of NATO. The faithful showed where their allegiances still lie, as Blas Pignard delivered his message of hate against those politicians blamed for what he called the tragic political and economic decline of Spain. It was a fine, rabble-rousing performance, and arms raised stiffly, they responded by singing the fascist battle hymn, Face to the Sun. Crown Prosecutor Ian Barker QC has told the jury at the Chamberlain trial that there's a massive body of evidence suggesting Azaria was murdered by her mother. Mr Barker was summing up the Crown case against Lindy and Michael Chamberlain. Earlier, QC John Phillips completed his final address to the jury after taking just under eight and a half hours to sum up the defence case. Lindy Chamberlain has denied murdering her daughter Azaria and her husband Michael has pleaded not guilty to being an accessory after the fact. And we'll be back in a minute with our special, The Man Who Shot the Pope. He's True Grit's boozing, womanizing, one-eyed Rooster Cogburn. Marshall Cogburn, you're in a sorry state. She's the lady, upper class and oh, so sweet. He's your maker. Together, they're the toughest gun-toting pair in the West. You got the gun, but you ain't got the know-how to use it. Being around you pleases me. Academy Award winners John Wayne and Catherine Hepburn. Oh, in Rooster Cogburn, the old West at its very best, 8.30 Wednesday night. The most magnificent machine ever made, the human body. It can do the most marvelous things, but to make sure your body works as well as it can for as long as possible, it's vital to understand the functioning of the body and the causes, symptoms, and treatment of ill health and disease. At last, one encyclopedia, the Family Health and Medical Library, has been written to tell you and your family the things you should know about the body. Read it. 
It's the cheapest health insurance you can get. Ladies, a little magic. It's called Swirl Off. Now, watch closely and see my nail lacquer disappear. Now you see it? Now you don't. Again, take the Swirl Off, dip the finger in, swirl around and... Totally clean. Now, the same amazing trick in strawberry flavor before your very eyes. Ta-da! Swirl Off by Andrea. It's magic. Available from all Soul Pattinson pharmacies. Smirnoff. The spirit of freedom lives. that can't figure out if GTX saves fuel. Is friction modified GTX really fuel efficient? Well, it was tested by a major fleet owner and they expect to cut more than $20,000 a year from their fuel bill. And when I tested GTX, the car definitely used less fuel. For me, GTX is fuel efficient because it saved me money. Hey boss, I just figured something out. What? I got my fingers stuck. Just remember, oils ain't oils. On the 13th of May, 1981, a 23-year-old Turk, Mehmet Ali Arjka, attempted to kill Pope John Paul II as the pontiff mingled with crowds in St. Peter's Square in Rome. Just why Arjka wanted to kill the Pope has never been fully explained. Some believe he acted on impulse, others think he was motivated by religious fanaticism. But there's a new theory now which suggests that Arjka was hired to assassinate the Pope by groups opposed to his close ties to the Solidarity Movement in Poland. Tonight we begin a two-part series which examines the theory that the plot to kill John Paul was hatched with the knowledge and perhaps the help of the Turkish Mafia, the Bulgarian Secret Service and the Soviet KGB. This report, The Man Who Shot the Pope, was compiled after nine months of research by an NBC news team. It happened on May 13, 1981, on a warm Wednesday afternoon. An unsuspecting Rome sparkled in the sunlight, each of its fountains a silent witness to other intrigues. The dome of St. Peter's dominated the skyline of the Eternal City. It was exactly 5.17 p.m. The Pope, riding in his white Jeep through the crowded square, had just opened his general audience, blessing a young girl and waving to the faithful. Then, suddenly, a hand, a gun, and a volley of fire the Pope slumped, hit by two bullets. By attempting to kill...